All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Casper, and I am your chair this year for the Broker Engagement Committee. And with me is also my co-chair, Donna Smith. And together, we are so excited to welcome all of you to this Broker Power Hour. We wanted to put this together to in re, uh, response to what we did about a month and a half ago, when we were able to bring a lot of you together as brokers to say, oh my goodness, here's what we know, here's where the PPP is. We know that you are all uh, like us, scrambling to try to figure out what to do next with regard to the, the coronavirus, uh, how to handle our clients, how to handle our agents, how to handle our offices, our staffs, everything. So thank you all for joining us this morning. And our first guest that's going to kick this off is our NAR president, Vince Delta. And I have to tell you, I say this a lot, but truly this year was the epitome of this. I do believe we always have the right president at the right time. And Vince has been so amazing throughout the last 90 days to just be completely available, to be at the ready, to help us navigate through these completely unprecedented times, and to help us not only with the staff at NAR who all got to go home and have, are still working from their houses to be able to not only put on a mid-year conference, but more importantly, and we'll talk about this in a minute, to really navigate these waters of how do we handle this with all of our agents uh, being independent contractors through the COVID virus um, and the shutdowns that we've all experienced. So with that, um, and without further ado, please help me welcome Vince Malta, your NAR president for 2020. Thank you, Tracy, and hello from San Francisco all. It's great to be in the company of so many of our brokers around the country. Welcome. And even though our meetings are virtual these days, I found during this time that I feel closer and more connected to members of my clients than ever before. I, I hope that you're feeling that same experience as well, because as we go through all this, the silver lining is we've added tools in our arsenal to demonstrate our value to you as an association and for all of us to demonstrate our value to consumers. Before I go further, I, I want to take just a moment to comment on the events of the past couple of weeks. Across the country, we've seen the hurt, the frustration, the outrage felt by millions of our members um, and fellow citizens after the senseless death of George Floyd. We at NAR feel the pain and outrage shared by millions of Americans in this historic moment. And we believe our neighbors where we live and work should feel safe and free from discrimination. NAR is committed to leading the way on policies that address racial injustice and that build safe and inclusive communities. Building the future begins with equal access to housing and opportunity for all. One of our priorities for 2020 is to continue to address and collaborate on the issues of equality and affordability in housing. The NAR leadership team passed a Fair Housing Action Plan earlier this year. We call our plan ACT, A-C-T for short, and it stands for accountability, culture change, and training. Among other proactive steps, this plan calls on us to create minimum core fair housing training requirements for all states and develop a model state licensing law to ensure real estate agents who violate fair housing laws are held accountable. We want to ensure that America's 1.4 million realtors are doing everything possible to protect housing rights in America. It's an imperative. It's our duty. Now, I would like to ask my friend, Nate Johnson, to share a story with you that has touched many of our members. Nate is NAR's public and federal issues liaison and president of Real Estate Solutions at Red Key Realty Leaders, the largest independent brokerage in St. Louis. Nate? Hi there, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share a couple of thoughts. You know, um, I, I didn't grow up in a house that my parents owned. And, um, you know, as my father was coming of age, I, it was perfectly legal to deny him housing and other opportunities. I was alive when it was legal to deny housing to women. And it was just about 30 years ago 
when it was still legal to deny housing to someone in a wheelchair and, and still it's federally legal to deny housing and limit these opportunities based on sexual orientation or gender identity. You know, uh, I'm not an advocate for patience, but I do realize that the wheels of justice turn slowly and we have made progress. In fact, I was alive when I wouldn't have been welcomed as a member of my local realtor association. And now I'm blessed to have the opportunity to help people achieve the American dream of home ownership every day. Uh, yeah, the roads to justice and equality certainly do move slowly. And as you may know, the, the challenges that we face today are, are born through policies, and we have to take ownership of this, that we as realtors created, supported, or ignored. And these policies have led to a lack of housing choices across our country, which has created diminished opportunities for upward mobility among African Americans and others. The, this plays a role in the peaceful protests and the tragic expressions of destruction that we have been seeing in our communities all over the country. And we have to educate ourselves on the history of injustice, civil rights, and, and fair housing in our country. And only then we're gonna understand how we arrived here. And we've got to continue to make sure that diverse voices are at the table and we have to support them by not allowing them to be a singular voice of diversity. You know, recently our president, Vince Malta, he did issue a statement about George Floyd. And this is the first time in the history of NAR that, they've made, that we've made a public statement like this. You know, that's progress. Um, the NAR, you know, the National Association of Realtors, we've got a Fair Housing Policy Committee now. We've hired a director of public policy, uh, of housing policy so that we can effectively advocate on national fair housing policy. And that's where real change is gonna take place. And this is progress. And we have to work to continue these efforts. And we've got to leverage the collective focus that the recent tragedy and the global pandemic has given us by getting involved wherever we can to create a better tomorrow for our society. Vince? Thank you, Nate. Thank you for sharing that important story. And thank you for all you're doing for our members this year. As you can imagine, I talk with tens of thousands of realtors across the country and that's been one of the most gratifying parts of the presidency in a year that's given us some unexpected challenges to say the least. Uh, there's no uh, realtor playbook for global pandemics and we're writing it uh, day by day as we go through this and as you are in your businesses. Members repeatedly ask me, when are we gonna return to business as usual? Well, my friends, this is business as usual. And to use a term that has been overused, but so true, this is the new norm. We have to recognize that this pandemic has changed our lives personally and professionally. But as realtors, we don't shy away from change. In fact, we're inventing our industry in real time. With technology and a little creativity, we're providing essential services to clients while prioritizing their health and safety. Thank you for your leadership and commitment during these difficult times. As we move into this next phase, businesses reopening, we must continue to practice the utmost care. At our offices, we need to create protocols to observe social distancing and how we manage our entrances and exits, how we control uh, uh, the people in areas um, at one time, and how we handle common spaces and equipment, even with something as simple as, as the coffee machine. NAR released comprehensive guidance on reopening offices with a checklist that includes everything from preparing the physical workspace to setting up office policies and staff training to creating a culture of open communication. We also created a guide to help members formulate best practices for showing properties during this time. These resources are available as part of our coronavirus guidance for realtors at nar.realtor slash coronavirus. Again, that's nar.realtor slash coronavirus. And as part of our program today, we're gonna to share even more resources with you to help you navigate this new normal. Research firm Engageus will present the results of a series of new surveys that offer invaluable consumer insights for undertaking what buyers and sellers expect of their brokers and agents during the pandemic. I urge you to use this data 
and develop transaction processes um, and uh, you know anything in your office to make sure all consumers feel comfortable and informed. Your buying and selling guidance couldn't be more important. In fact, it's essential, just like real estate is essential. So on behalf of the National Association of Realtors, I thank you and I'll turn it back to Tracy now. Thank you, Vince. Appreciate all that you have done, truly. So we do have a jam-packed agenda. We have some great information that we're going to share with you. But first, I have to just say, we have to give kudos to our NAR leaders, our uh, staff, and certainly those who have taken the relationships that they have cultivated over years and years and years and truly put them on the line. So our staff has just been working overtime to be in those rooms, to have conversations, to make sure that we as independent contractors were included in conversations with unemployment and different benefits that came out, including the PPP. So part of what you're gonna hear today is the follow-up to that. Now that we have the money, how can we now report that back? What is the use? What have those changes been? So we're gonna hear from our staff, truly the gurus that understand this, to share with us what can we look forward to now. Excuse me what we can look forward to now as we're reporting those dollars and hopefully getting those dollars forgiven. Again, Vince also mentioned that we're going to be talking to uh, the gentleman that did the survey of our clients and customers to find out what they were looking for from us um, in that leadership role for them. And it was such good information. We want to make sure and share it with all of you. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mabel Guzman. She is our VP of advocacy this year for the uh, NAR, and she is also going to be then followed up again by Nate Johnson, and they will be sharing with us all of those wins that we've had so that you understand <clears throat> exactly what those benefits are that are available to you as brokers and for your agents as independent contractors, and more importantly, for our clients and customers. So with that, I would like to introduce Mabel Guzman. Thanks, Tracy. Although COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and businesses, NAR's political operations have proceeded full steam ahead. In March, Congress passed and the president signed a $2 trillion relief bill, the largest economic stimulus package in American history. The CARES Act contains numerous benefits for realtors, which NAR fought hard for. Those include unemployment eligibility for the self-employed and independent contractors, who are not usually covered under traditional state unemployment benefit programs. It includes an employment retention tax credit, estimated to provide 50 billion to companies that retain existing employees. And it includes a delay in payroll, in business payroll tax payment. The CARES Act also included unprecedented aid, nearly $350 billion in loans for small businesses that could be used for mortgage interest, rent, utilities, and payroll cost. And some of those loans are forgivable. When funding for the Paycheck Protection and Economic Injury Disaster Loan programs ran out, NARA's advocacy team continued to push Congress to take quick action to appropriate more funds. Both programs were soon back up and running. The Paycheck Protection Program received an additional $310 billion, while IDLE received an additional $60 billion. Then last week, Congress passed and the President signed the PPP Flexibility Act, which NAR supported. It amends the CARES Act to bring more flexibility to PPP loans. Among other things, the legislation extends the length of time businesses can use the loans from eight weeks to 24 weeks, and it lowers the payroll spend amount from 75% to 60%. NAR encourages anyone who qualifies and needs this help to apply. The deadline is June 30th. The massive economic stimulus programs also contain provisions critical to consumers and the real estate industry. Under the CARES Act, borrowers of government-backed securities can request up to 360 days of payment forbearance without proof of hardship and without penalties. Eligible multifamily property owners with federally insured loans can request forbearance for 30 days due to financial hardship with extensions of up to total of 90 days and borrowers who receive forbearance may not evict or charge late fees to tenants for the duration of the forbearance period. NAR also supported delays for 1031 like-kind exchange and opportunity zone deadlines, which the IRS subsequently implemented. 
If you have any questions about recent relief legislation, including PPP and EIDL loans, we have detailed and regularly updated FAQs available at nar.realtor slash coronavirus. Now Nate Johnson will look ahead to the critical issues NAR is pursuing on Capitol Hill. Thank you and take it away, Nate. Thanks, Mobel. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Nate Johnson again, a public and federal issues liaison and a realtor from St. Louis, Missouri. So we're watching for a potential fifth relief bill from Capitol Hill, one that will ensure continued funding and address provisions of earlier bills before these provisions sunset. The House's version of this next round, the $3 trillion HEROES Act, passed in May. Although the White House and Senate Republicans dismissed it, they have indicated that they're open to another bill. NAR is urging Senate action on further legislation of this kind. The HEROES Act contains several items that we support to help drive the debate forward. They include the repeal of SALT, $10 billion more for the PPP, plus some fixes, $75 billion for mortgage relief, $100 billion for assistance for renters, and $5.5 billion in broadband internet funding. Meanwhile, NAR is also engaged with lawmakers to advocate for policy priorities like a uniform nationwide remote online notarization law, liability protections for businesses that reopen following federal and state guidelines, housing relief for renters, including emergency rental assistance, as well as relief for rental housing providers, expansion of forbearance and unemployment assistance, reforms to the Opportunity Zones program to encourage investment, elimination of the marriage penalty in the state and local tax deduction, home ownership tax incentives, and more. The bottom line is that we will continue to make the realtor voice heard in every lawmaker's office. There's a lot at stake this year as we prepare for elections at all three levels of government. Our advocacy work and our collective voice is more important than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Nate and Mabel. It's so crazy to imagine what our staff has been able to accomplish over the last 90 days. And truly, it's because of those relationships. But we also know that those relationships, as Nate just mentioned, translate to the state and the local level. So thank you to you brokers, because we know a lot of you are involved at that level. And it was imperative for all of us to be able to work with our local and our state officials when we were all trying to become essential services at home as well. So thank you, Nate and Mabel, for that update. And thank you to our staff and all of our leadership who really truly did put those relationships on the line and said, we have got to be at the table with this, and they were. So that was huge for all of us on this call. I'm excited to introduce our next guest as well. I have had the chance to listen to him before and to um, see the results of this survey. So this was why we thought it would be so important for the brokers to hear this because he truly did a great job. And this is Rich Tao. He's the president of Engage Us. His firm specializes in message testing and message refinement for major associations, advocacy groups, and large corporations. He's also the co-creator of the Back to Normal Barometer. And that's where he worked with NAR to be able to talk to our clients and customers to say, what is it that they're looking for from us as brokers? And we also know that you guys are going to have a lot of questions as we get off of this call. So I'm just going to give this to you right now. There is a great resource at broker.realtor. There's an 800 number. If you have specific questions to anything you've heard or will hear on this call, you can go to that number and get those answers there as well, or reach out to any of us on the call. But without further ado, I am so excited to be able to introduce Rich Tao. So Rich, take it away. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's an honor and delight to be with all of you today. I just want to get my slides here up on the screen. Uh, so just let me dive right in and talk about the research that we've been conducting for the realtors. And we've been doing two different research projects. Every two weeks, we do something called the Back to Normal Barometer, the Tracy reference, where we're looking at what it's going to take to get people to re-engage in a whole variety of sectors. Separate from that, we did a major standalone custom research project for the realtors, and that's going to be the bulk of my presentation. But let me just tell you very briefly about what we've been uncovering in the Back to Normal Barometer. So we've been asking about a variety of sectors in travel, leisure, as well as home buying. And what we found was that 56%, that little arrow you see in the third bar, 56% of people who have toured a home in the last year 
are willing to engage in that activity right now. That was in research that we had done back in May, and actually since then that number has uh, crept up significantly. It's well over 60% now. So there's a sizable percentage of people who are ready to go immediately, and they don't need any further assurance. They're ready to do it. And among those people who are still hesitant, if they got the necessary assurances, three quarters of them would re-engage and be willing to take an, a, a tour a home or attend an open house sometime in the next three months. So again, if they got the assurances they need, three quarters are back. So I, I want, wouldn't want you to take away from what you're hearing in the media that everybody's locked into their house and they're not ready to come out. Uh, some people are ready to go now, a majority are, and the, among those who are hesitant, there's a sizable my, majority who would return given the assurances that, that they're looking for. So let's focus now the rest of the presentation on the custom research project we did for NAR. And we're gonna talk about buyers and sellers. And I wanna just give you a very quick overview of the research followed by some good news about agents' perceived value during the pandemic, what virtual tours can and can't do, and how to improve them, some precautions, uh, which ones are good and which ones will endure. We're gonna talk about litigious buyers and sellers, just to put that on your radar screen. Talk about how agents can meet high expectations in these trying times. And then we'll, I'll, I'll summarize with the key action items that are derived from this research, basically the news you can use. So first of all, we did a broad study, first half of May. We looked at more than a thousand buyers and sellers. And we divided and sliced and diced the research in a whole variety of ways, but I just wanna make sure that I put two of them on your radar screen. On the left, we, you'll see that we have buyers and sellers and the buyers and sellers are divided between those who were active at the time we did the research and those who had suspended the, either their search if they were buyers or their sales if they are sellers. So when you see active versus suspended, that's what I'm referencing during the presentation. And on the right, you see the same audience divided differently into what we call COVID heavy areas and COVID light areas. The COVID heavy areas, I'm gonna show you a list of them in a moment, are the ones where the disease took its greatest toll in the United States. So if you see reference during the presentation to COVID heavy and you live in one of those areas, I'm referring to your neck of the woods. These are the COVID heavy metro areas at the time we did the research. So just take a look for a second and see whether you're on the list. If you are, I'm again referring to you. If you're not, then you're in a COVID light area. So I wanna start off with good news. You're even more highly valued now than you were before. So we asked respondents to evaluate a variety of statements on a scale from one to 10 in terms of how strongly they agreed. These are the percentages of people who strongly agreed with these statements. There were more than 80% who agreed either strongly or somewhat. These are the, the majorities who strongly agreed. So there's an intensity to this. First statement. Particularly during the pandemic, a real estate agent's guidance is especially valued. 54% of buyers and 62% of sellers strongly agreed with that statement. And then the other statement, buying and selling real estate is an essential service. 59% of buyers, 58% of sellers strongly agreed with that statement. So again, you're really highly valued now. Let's talk a little bit about pandemic virtual tours and ways to boost their value. So in order to set the context for this, let me just tell you about the respondents themselves and their comfort levels with technology. So we asked them, on a scale from one to 10, how comfortable are you conducting business on a computer, such as reviewing and signing documents electronically? And what you see here is that 70% of the buyers, 60%, 67% of the sellers are very comfortable. They scored that at eight, nine, or 10 on a one to 10 scale. Then you look at the sub-segments that over-index, so people living in the COVID heavy areas, slightly over-indexed. People who are actively buying or selling over-indexed. Men more than women over-indexed. People middle-aged over-indexed. People living in the Northeast and the West. And then people who live in cities as opposed to in suburbs or in rural areas, over-indexed. And they're also comfortable with online tours. You see that there are 57% of buyers, 59% of sellers who are very comfortable with doing online tours. And again, you see the subcategories that over-index, very similar to the ones who are comfortable with technology. 
And what we learned, particularly from buyers, is that virtual tours were great for vetting. So 55% strongly agreed that virtual home tours allow buyers to quickly distinguish between homes they'd dismiss and homes they'd seriously consider. So to help separate the wheat from the chaff, if you will, virtual tours play an, an important role for buyers. But they're not quite a substitute for an actual visit. And here you see a difference between the buyers and the sellers and the percentages who strongly agree. So the statement on the left is taking a virtual tour of a home for sale is an acceptable substitute for taking a tour in person. 37% of buyers strongly agreed, but 52% of sellers strongly agreed with that statement. Then we asked it on the right in a slightly different fashion. Taking a thorough virtual internet tour of a home for sale where one can carefully examine each room in depth and then ask follow-up questions to the agent and or owner is an acceptable substitute for taking a tour in person. And what you see here is that when you add all those various conditions, the numbers for buyers actually creep up by five percentage points. So the, the virtual tour in conjunction with other things to help them understand the property better, make that okay as a substitute for a visit. So what we found particularly interesting was that there was a sizable minority of buyers who could envision buying a home without ever physically stepping inside. 41% strongly agreed that they can envision doing that. Whereas among the, buyer, among the sellers, a majority strongly agreed that they can envision selling a home without ever having prospective buyers enter their home. But that said, there's a bit of a division here. 53% of the buyers said, even though prospective buyers can take internet tours of homes, someone who buys a home without ever visiting it in person is making a huge mistake. So you have real differences of opinion here based upon, your, again, your comfort with technology, uh, your age, there are some cr criteria that really distinguish the, the buyers on the left from the buyers on the right. And in terms of boosting the value of virtual tours, we uncovered a couple of items that had strong, strong levels of agreement. On the left, virtual tours would be more useful if they include a tour of the neighborhood as well as of the home, both inside and outside. And on the right, you see strong major majority strongly agreeing virtual tours would be more valuable if they were paired with access to written information about home improvements the seller has made. So that additional add-on information would, is perceived to boost the value of virtual tours. The other thing I'd say is that agents enhance that value. We saw a majority of buyers and sellers strongly agreeing. It is very important to have a real estate professional help buyers navigate many of the virtual home buying options. And then the st statement on the right, it, only 38% strongly agree, and that's a good thing, because the statement is, when buyers take virtual home tours rather than in-person in tours, the value of real estate agents goes down significantly. So you wanna have a smaller percentage strongly agreeing with that, and only 38% strongly agree that the value of the agents goes down. So let's talk now about precautions. So most precautions are viewed as good ideas that buyers and sellers would comply with. So there are two kinds of precautions that we looked at. The first kind are precautions that require one's own involvement. I'll talk about the second category in a few minutes, but we had people rate various precautions that required their own involvement. So we asked uh, buyers to evaluate a whole variety of precautions. I'm going to take you through them quickly now just so you can become familiar with them. Um, first one is allowing the real estate agent to touch anything in the home with gloves only. Not allowing children under the age of 12 into the home and I'll explain to you why we didn't go into more depth on this in a second. There's an asterisk there for a reason. Ending the practice of having agents drive with prospective buyers in a single car from home to home. Limiting the amount of time a visitor can stay in the home to 30 minutes. Limiting the, the number of visitors in the home to two to four at a time, including the agent. Prohibiting all visitors from touching anything in the home. Providing sanitary wipes, so if a visitor needs to touch something, he or she can use it to wipe something down. Require all buyers and sellers to review a list of CDC guidelines for protecting oneself from COVID-19 and have those buyers and sellers sign a document indicating they read the list. Requiring all people in the home, buyers, sellers, and agents to wear gloves, masks, and shoe coverings. 
Requiring all sellers, buyers, and agents to have their temperatures taken prior to showing or visiting a home. Requiring all the sellers, buyers, and agents to pass a nasal swab test. And requiring buyers, sellers to complete a form certifying they have no symptoms of COVID-19. And requiring buyers and sellers to sign a document outlining protocols for notification if someone shows symptoms after the visit. And requiring buyers, sellers, and agents to remain six feet apart at all times. And just so you know, the reason why those un under age 12 were removed uh, was it has something to do, obviously, as you see there with the Fair Housing Act. And so we wanted to make sure that that was in there. So in the data I'm going to share you, with you, although people were asked about under age 12, um, it's not something that um, we're going to be sharing in the actual results. So what you see is the following. We asked respondents to look at that whole list of precautions I just shared with you and to score them from one to 10 on two different metrics. One is how bad or good idea it was, the higher it goes, the, more, the, the better it is, the worse, the lower the number, how, that makes it more, worse. And then on the y-axis, how willing would they be to comply personally with taking that step as a buyer? Uh, one being uh, not at all willing to comply, 10 being um, uh, folk willingness to comply. And what you see is in that shaded area, all those precautions I just shared with you, basically all score in that narrow range. And you're probably wondering, where do they score? Well, if you blow up just that segment between six and nine on the x-axis and six and nine on the y-axis, that's where they fall. And what you see here is that the top scoring one is the providing of sanitary wipes, um, staying six feet apart, uh, everybody wearing masks, gloves, and shoe coverings, uh, and having uh, two to four visitors only. So, um, and then, so again, I want to overstate this. They're all in a very narrow band. The th item that scores lowest down um, is the nasal swab test. And, we, and we've tested this in a variety of contexts. And repeatedly what we found is that the nasal swab test is the stuff that people are least willing to comply with. And they think it's the least good idea because it is invasive. And not that any of you necessarily are doing nasal swab tests, but just for the sake of asking it, you know where it falls on the spectrum. And then we asked uh, sellers to evaluate a variety of precautions. Let me just quickly go through these, allowing only the real estate agent to touch anything with gloves, removing all the pets from the home, requiring buyers and sellers to review a list of CDC guidelines, requiring all the people in the home to wear gloves, masks, and shoe coverings, requiring all the sellers to vacate the house during the showing, requiring all the sellers, buyers, and agents to have their temperature taken, requiring all sellers, buyers, and agents to pass a nasal swab test, requiring buyers and sellers to complete a form certifying they have no symptoms, requiring buyers and sellers to sign a document outlining protocols for notification, requiring buyers and sellers to all stand six feet apart, requiring the agent to affirm in writing that he or she has been favor, fever and illness free for the past 14 days. And require the seller to affirm in writing that all residents have been fever and illness free for the past 14 days. Okay, so those are the list of items that the sellers were asked to evaluate. And again, it fell in a very narrow band. Let me show you where it, it stood. So this, the sellers saw the most value in the precautions on the far top right, staying six feet apart, everybody wearing masks, gloves, and shoe coverings, and the agent affirming that uh, he or she has no illness. And then everything else is clustered very, very close together. You're talking about within fractions of a point. And again, of course, the nasal swab test is the outlier. So I just took you through pre precautions that require one's own involvement. Now let's talk about precautions that others would take on your behalf. And rather than having two uh, different scales that people evaluated. In this case, because it didn't require their own involvement, we didn't have to ask them how willing they were to do it. We asked just how good or a bad idea is it? So these are the precautions that buyers rated that they thought that sellers or agents would take on their behalf. On a scale from one to 10, how good or bad it is, 10 being the best, here are the ones that scored the highest and it's in descending order. The hand sanitizer, knowing that the seller cleans and disinfects frequently touch objects, informing visitors that the home is professionally sanitized or fumigated. In the entryway, the agent provides visitors a list of all the precautions, uh, requiring the seller to affirm that all the residents have been fever and illness free, requiring the agent to affirm that he or she has been illness, uh, fever and illness free, removing all the pets, requiring the sellers to vacate the housing during the showing, and laying floor protection paper throughout the home to signal to visitors where it is okay to walk. To walk. 
So all of these are generally considered to be good ideas from 8.5 down to 7.3, not a massive difference. But generally, these things were all viewed to be good to varying degrees. We then asked the sellers to rate things that buyers or agents would do on their behalf. Let me just take you down that list. The top scoring one, limit the number of visitors in the home to two to four at a time, including the agent, providing sanitary wipes, making hand sanitizer available. In the entryway, the agent provides a list of all the precautions, limiting the amount of time a visitor can stay in the home, prohibiting all visitors from touching anything, informing all visitors that the home was professionally sanitized or fumigated, and again, the, the laying of the floor protection paper on the floor to signal where it's okay to walk. So again, all these items scored in the sevens, not massive differences across them. Basically, they're all things that are seen as positive things to do. Then we were asked uh, to look at three precautions that will endure after the pandemic was over. For me as a researcher, this to me was arguably one of the most interesting questions that we've asked. So these are the percentages of respondents who think that these practices should continue once the pandemic has long passed. So 55% of buyers and 44% of sellers thought that making hand sanitizer available throughout the house is something that should continue after the pandemic has passed. Uh, providing sanitary wipes, again, buyers more than sellers, and then limiting the, the number of visitors in the home to two to four at a time, including the agent. So from a cultural perspective, I would suggest you do not be surprised that of all the things you're doing now to get people into a home, that these are the three that last and maybe you'll be doing them a year, two, five or 10 years from now. So let's talk now about litigious buyers and sellers. This is not to scare you, mainly to, to put this on your radar screen. And I just want you to take a moment to look at that disclaimer that you see an asterisk at the bottom of the screen um, and just to put this in context. So. Uh, the survey revealed that some of the buyers and sellers may be tempted to sue brokers if they contract COVID-19 during a showing. These are interesting statistics and good to be aware of um, during the pandemic, but it does not necessarily mean that buyers and sellers would have a strong case for suing their brokers. So just want to put that out there. So that said, let me show you what we asked. We asked the question, imagine you had visited a home on the first of the month, and on the seventh of the month, you found out that one of the residents had COVID-19. A few days later, you came down with the illness yourself. How likely would you be to pursue legal action against your real estate broker? What you see here is that 38% of buyers scored that at eight, nine, or 10 on a one to 10 scale of likelihood to pursue legal action against their broker. And then you see the subcategories that are over-indexing on that question. People living in COVID heavy areas, people who are active in their uh, buying as opposed to suspending their buying. Men, much more so than women. Uh, younger people, middle-aged people, those living in the Northeast and those who live in a city. So those are the groups that over-index for the temptation or the propensity to sue. Again, it's not that they're going to, it's just these are the ones to be most aware of would be more likely than others to do it. And then the question becomes, what if we had people sign a release? So the question here is, imagine the same scenario, but the only difference is that you signed a release before seeing the home, holding your real estate broker harmless if you or a member of your family came down with COVID-19. In that situation, how likely would you be to pursue legal action? And that number drops to 29%. And you see who still over indexes in that case, it's men and it's people who live in a city. The sellers actually have a higher percentage. So the same situation there, imagine you showed your home on the first of the month and on the seventh of the month, you found out someone who visited had COVID-19, then you come down with it yourself. So 48% said they'd be very likely to sue among the sellers. It over-indexes here again for men, middle-aged, living in the Northeast, um, and particularly living in cities. And then if they signed a release, the numbers drop somewhat, but you still have groups that still significantly over-index Again, the men, middle-aged, Northeast, and people who live in cities. What was interesting here was um, we found that there was a strong willingness of, among people to comply with a requirement that all visitors sign a form waiving their right to sue the seller or agent for COVID-19. But the, among the groups that were under-indexing and in their willingness to comply, 
as you see, are those who were active, those living in COVID light areas, and those who were 34 or younger in particular. So these were the ones who were least willing to waive their right as buyers to sue. Now let's just transition on moving towards the last part of the presentation. Uh, agents provide high value and during the pandemic need to meet those high expectations. One thing we found um, was that agents are expected to know and enforce rules. So these are percentages who strongly agreed. 64% both of buyers and sellers strongly agreed. Agents should understand state and federal protocols for COVID-19 safety and take the lead for buyers and sellers at homes for sale. And again, new identical numbers strongly agree with this statement. If a buyer or seller is not following health protocols during a home visit, I expect the real estate agent to address the matter and resolve it. We also found that majority strongly agreed with these statements. I would be comfortable signing closing documents electronically for a real estate transaction. Similarly, it is essential that an agent or broker be knowledgeable about ways to electronically sign some or all closing documents for a real estate transaction. They have high expectations on the electronic side. And the agents also add value to the online search process. Three statements to be aware of. The first, an agent can help buyers glean more valuable information from online listings than buyers could uncover on their own. A majority of buyers and even larger majority of sellers strongly agree with that. An agent can save a buyer the time and stress of weeding through online listings. Majorities strongly agree with that. And an agent should work with sellers to provide more in-depth pictures and videos of properties than what buyers can find in online search portals. Nearly two thirds of buyers and sellers strongly agree with that. So here's how you can add value. And then we asked about comfort with various sales steps, things that you have to do when you're going through the sales process. And you'll see quite a difference across these three steps. The first one, these are the percent of people who'd be very comfortable with these steps. So half of buyers, nearly uh, three fifths of sellers would be very comfortable closing on a home remotely where the buyer and seller are not physically together to sign documents, but instead do so electronically. Next, having sellers say secluded in part of the home while an inspector and buyers evaluate the home. 42% of buyers were very comfortable with that. 52% of sellers were very comfortable with that. And then finally, an appraiser views only the exterior of the house in person and relies additionally on viewing photos of the interior. 29% of buyers were very comfortable with that, while 46% of sellers were comfortable with that. And then we asked a question about how important it was to actually meet agents in person. We found that 40% of buyers strongly agreed and 52% of sellers strongly agreed. I would be comfortable buying or selling a home without ever meeting my real estate agent in person. So again, sizable numbers of people who are willing to do that. That said, they put a premium on oral communication. We asked them, uh, whether a certain method of communication makes them feel comfortable or connected with their agent. Talking on the phone, 72% of buyers, 66% of sellers, makes them feel very connected or comfortable in interacting with their agent that, via that method. Talking by Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, or other tech that allows electronic face-to-face -face conversation. Again, large minorities, very comfortable with that. Communicating via email, majorities, definitely there. Going to text, you start to see a bit of a drop off and then just watching instructional videos posted online by the agent, that becomes a much lower percentage of people, uh, makes them feel comfortable or connected with their agent. So let's circle back to where we started. I'm about to wrap up. Agents really matter during the pandemic. We asked the question slightly differently and what we found, these are the percentages who say that during the current pandemic, relying upon a real estate professional when searching for a home or selling a home is much more important than before. 47% of the buyers and 53% of the sellers strongly agreed with that statement. And you see who over-indexed for those on that particular statement. Again, 
again, it definitely concentrates in the COVID heavy areas and among men and the Northeast and people who live in cities. So let me just wrap up with the key action items for the current moment. Actively help buyers and sellers get more out of online. Pair virtual tours with written information about home improvement. Be sure to include a tour of the neighborhood with the house tour. Actively engage in the online search process for and with the buyers. Be prepared to limit the number of visitors at one time. Keep it clean. Stock up on sanitizer and wipes. Those things are likely to be permanent in the house selling and buying process. Understand why buyers and sellers might be litigation prone. Know the protocols, follow them, and don't be afraid to enforce them. The buyers and the sellers are expecting the agents to be the ones who do the enforcement. Talk to your clients. Don't just text and email them. They want to hear your voice and they want to be able to interact with you that way. And never forget, buyers and sellers need you and they know it. So your value is tremendous. So with that, I am happy to turn it back for questions. Rich, thank you for that. So I have to tell you, after I heard your presentation the first time, I because uh, I know all of us brokers are trying to find content. I had at my next meeting with my agents, one of the best meetings I've ever had, especially through all of this, because we've all been trying to react. We've all been trying to uh, be proactive, but this really gave us what we were needing to know that we were doing the right thing. So I can't thank you enough. And I know my agents are the same way. So the brokers on the call, I will tell you, this is such great information, but it's also nice to know that they did rely on us. So thank you for that assurance as well. Uh, because we were all working really hard, especially those that were trying to do it remotely and from home and, and all of the things and going virtual. So appreciate so much that information. So with that, I am so excited now to be able to introduce two of our NAR staff, uh, two that have been on that front lines that do have those great relationships that are going to share with us some information on what they've been able to accomplish over the last several days. Uh, so that they can share with you. So we're looking for some information on the SBA. What's that follow-up? Now that we got the PPP money, how do we report it? What do we need to do now? So we're going to have Erin Stackley. She's going to be talking to us about that. And then directly following her, Ken Fierce, who is our GSE uh, guru. He understands them, knows them, helped write a paper to help reform them, but right now is working in the trenches with all of those institutes and policymakers to really help our clients with the forbearance conversation and what does that look like for them now that they're in it and getting through it and afterwards. So with that, Erin. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you to everyone on this call. You all are truly our boots on the ground. Um, I know that I rely on the feedback from you all as to what resources you need, what we can be doing in the advocacy group at NAR to help you get through this and um, your personal experience applying for PPP loans and, and working your way through that process has been very helpful to me, so thank you all. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, PPP loans and I'm also going to very briefly touch on uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, so as you may know, last week the president signed into law the PPP Flexibility Act and this does exactly what the title says it adds some flexibility to how borrowers can utilize those PPP loans that they receive. So really quick, I wanna first talk about what hasn't changed with the program. First of all, the deadline to apply for a PPP loan is still June 30th. So people have a little less than three weeks left to get that in. There is a chance that Congress could extend the program, but at this time, the Senate seems to have more appetite for targeted relief. And yes, the program does still have funding. I have been telling people that the latest reports have it around $100 billion left. At yesterday's Senate Small Business Committee hearing, ranking Senator Cardin stated that it had $140 billion left. So let's split it somewhere in the middle and say it's got between $100 and $140 billion left in funding. Small businesses with employees can still get up to two and a half times their average monthly payroll cost with individual salaries capped at $100,000 in loans, and independent contractors can still get up to two and a half times their average monthly net income from 2019, also capped at $100,000. So what did the PPP Flexibility Act change? 
Well, one of the biggest things that have changed, and this was in response to hearing from borrowers and trade associations like NAR, as well as the business community, is it lowers the threshold that's required to go toward payroll costs. Initially, the SBA and the Treasury set that amount at 75% of the loan. So in order to have your loan fully forgiven, 75% of the loan amount had to go toward maintaining payroll costs. But as many businesses pointed out, they were essentially getting turned into temporary unemployment offices as they were paying employees who weren't able to come to work because of safety regulations and measures in their community. So the PPP Flexibility Act lowers that threshold to 60%. Borrowers now can use 40% of their loan proceeds to go toward another eligible use, which includes mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. Um, and still be eligible to have 100% of that loan forgiven. The bill also extends the coverage period for utilizing those loans. Initially, the agencies had set that uh, time period at eight weeks, but they have extended it now to 24 weeks, um, with the absolute last day that you could utilize it, the end of this year, December 31st. Um, this gives borrowers, again, more flexibility with how they can stretch those loan amounts out. So the businesses are more likely to be able to reopen at the end of this pandemic, as opposed to just temporarily keep people on payroll for eight weeks. Um, it also extends the rehire exemption. One of the requirements for 100% forgiveness for these uh, PPP loans is that you must keep the same number of employees on payroll. Uh, what the PPP Flexibility Act does is it uh, basically expands the exemptions that were already included in there. First of all, you have until the end of the year to make any rehires. And second of all, if you were unable to rehire an employee because of regulations and safety measures required due to COVID-19, and you can show that, then you would not be held to that same standard. So if you're in a small office space and you typically would have six employees working in there, but because of social distancing requirements, you can now only have three, that would be an exemption from rehiring the three people that you've had to let go. Another change, and this isn't from the legislation, but from agency action, um, is that businesses can use an alternate timeline for their payroll cost portion of the loan. Basically, if you get your loan, say you got it dispersed to your account this past Tuesday, June 9th. Well, your payroll period probably didn't start on June 9th, so the covered period for uh, putting the required now 60% toward payroll shouldn't begin to toll on that day. So you can begin uh, using those funds for payroll costs on the next first day of your pay period. That only applies to payroll costs, though. We are still waiting on updated forms and guidance from the SBA and the Treasury to reflect these changes. Uh, we had just gotten our forgiveness application forms and we were very happy that they put those out and now they have to go back and edit them to make these changes. But generally, uh, borrowers will have to provide proof of their payroll costs. So work with your HR department or work with your payroll processor. They'll have to show that they maintained the same number of employees or show how much they had to drop that by, as well as any reductions in employee salary. They will also have to provide um, billing statements that show their utility bills, their rent payments, uh, their mortgage interest, um, just to show that all these funds went to the appropriate uses. The Treasury announced that they will be automatically auditing any loans above $2 million. But for loans lower than that amount, we expect that there will be some random audits, but they are generally applying a, um, a good faith standard to those. So that is what's been going on with the PPP loans. And now very briefly, I'm just going to touch on the pandemic unemployment assistance. I can get to that slide. Thank you. Um, so pandemic unemployment, this is a temporary uh, program created by the CARES Act. It's a, a sort of uh, cooperation between the Department of Labor and the states themselves. So the states are the ones that are actually uh, dispersing these benefits. That's where people apply to. There were a lot of issues at the beginning of this program. Um, states had issues with the technology. There was also an issue with the fact that independent contractors were eligible for it. 
but typically they're not eligible for unemployment. Those forms didn't reflect that. So they had to go back and update all of that. Um, you can check your eligibility at your state labor agency. As we understand at this point, most if not all states have their programs up and running. Under the program, individuals who are fully or partially unemployed can qualify for up to 39 weeks of assistance through the end of the year. And through the end of July, they can qualify for an additional $600 a week in federal unemployment funding. This means that even in states where real estate services have been labeled as essential, realtors may still be able or eligible for those benefits if they aren't able to completely return to work due to the um, pandemic safety measures. Uh, currently, 42 million Americans have applied for unemployment and 10 million are receiving that pandemic unemployment assistance benefit, according to the Department of Labor. We do have concerns about what happens after that July 31st date. Um, this came from the CARES Act, which, as was mentioned, passed in March. I don't know if anybody was really thinking that we would all still be sort of locked inside um, by mid-June, but we probably won't be back to normal by the end of July. So there is some concern about how that will impact the economy and those individuals. We are following uh, this very closely in Congress and monitoring what happens. We also have a lot of resources on our coronavirus page, both for SBA and uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance. And finally, I'll just answer one question that I always get. Can I get PPP and PUA? Uh, you can apply for both, but PPP replaces your salary, so you probably won't qualify for PUA while getting paid through PPP. With that, I will turn it over to Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erin, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Well, I'm going to be talking about forbearance today. Uh, and uh, while forbearance is new for some people, it's actually been around for several decades. Uh, forbearance was not utilized heavily during the last crisis because unfortunately a lot of people ended up in foreclosure or in short sale or deed in lieu. This time around, however, the federal government was very aggressive in rolling out forbearance programs to really help with the pandemic response. And the idea being simply put, that if a lot of people are gonna be forced to be out unemployed, they're gonna need help to pay those mortgage, mortgages uh, and rental payments very quickly, or we're gonna undermine the actual pandemic response. So the idea here is to provide housing security. So what is forbearance? Uh, in simply put, it delays your payments. And that's important to understand, it doesn't forgive them. You're going to pay, make those payments one way or the other, it's just a matter of when. And it gives you that flexibility. Uh, again, it's not new. Uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the FHA, VA, and Roll have literally had these for decades, but really heavily refined them, fortunately, in the, in the, in the uh, hurricane crisis in 2017 and 2018. So really the, the pumps are kind of primed coming into this event. Now, again, I've mentioned Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, rural, the government programs, because it's important to understand there are really two flavors. The government-backed programs provide a lot more options uh, and protections uh, versus the private programs. And there are nearly 6,500 different lenders out there, private lenders that hold loans in portfolio or private label securitizations. So it's very important to understand what your loan is and then reach out to your lender and servicer to find out about your options, especially if it's not government-backed. Next slide, please. Now, uh, what can you expect? Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about the government-backed loans, and then I'm gonna shift over to the non-government-backed. So, uh, as I mentioned before, there were a number of different programs already in place. Congress passed what was called the CARES Act, and under the CARES Act, really, they clarified these options and made them uniform across all the government programs so that the FHA and VA programs linked up with the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac programs. And what they offer is deferral of payments, uh, but they do so without fees or penalties. They also don't charge interest on the amounts that you are, are forbearing. So every month you pay principal and interest, but you're not gonna be charged interest on those amounts. Uh, also, it's important to note that you do still have to continue to pay uh, taxes and insurance during that period. Those are not forgiven, so it's important to understand. But the, the bar for getting into these programs is much lower in terms of verification. Why? Because they wanted to roll these out very quickly uh, and get these in the hands of people very quickly. This is not a niche product anymore. Nearly 6 million of the 45 million people with a mortgage right now have already taken advantage of this. So this has gone from 
a real fringe product to mainstream, and they're trying to make it widely available to, again, help the pandemic response. Now, what happens when you need to repay? Well, there are a number of different options, and so you really need to talk to your servicer about which one is, is best for you. Uh, you can make small repayments over the life of the loan, or you can make one lump sum at the end when you pay off your home for sale or refinance, but it's, it's really uh, a negotiation between you and your lender. There should be no credit impact if you comply with the program. And that's critical. You've got to comply with the program. If you don't, you could get hit with fees uh, or other penalties. Uh, and worse, you get your credit affected. But if you comply with the program, uh, by law, the lender has to report you as current on your mortgages. Uh, and then finally, again, want to reiterate this, reach out to your servicer and your lender. The programs may differ if you are not government backed. Uh, so next slide, please. So in terms of best practices, the first thing you start out with is the last thing I just mentioned, figure out whether it's government backed or not. The link right here, and we'll share these links with you uh, in the chat. Uh, this is on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's website. And it is literally a search engine to find out if your loan is not is government backed or not. If it's not, you'll need to reach out again to your service lender to, to figure out how, how, how it's structured. Then you need to inform yourself, what am I going to hear on the phone? And what do I need to ask? Well, when the programs first got rolled out, there's a lot of confusion. And we reported this to our contacts at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and they were really aghast because consumers and many of our, of our members were getting told things that were actually not part of the CARES Act. So they literally rolled out scripts that the servicers and lenders are required to use when they deal with person who has forbearance. So they have to read these scripts verbatim when they are working with lender. But that gives you or arms you with, with a very valuable tool read these scripts in advance so you know what they're going to ask so you know what kind of questions you want to ask and how to answer and so that you can have a really informed discussion so after that discussion make sure you get everything in writing uh, so that you understand exactly what the outline of your program is and so that you comply with it and then make sure that you comply with that program because again if you deviate from it you could get hit with penalties and interest and your credit scores could be dinged significantly and again uh, even if your, your loan is not government backed, this is a great outline to begin with because it give, makes you aware of the potential options out there and it really raises your financial literacy. So last slide, please. So these are two very good sources to begin with. The top one is, is the Consumer Financial, uh, sorry, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's website. Uh, we worked with them to actually bring all these resources together. Originally, they were spread out over about five or six government uh, websites. We, we asked them to bring it together and basically create a much more user-friendly website than most government programs. And they were able to do that very, very quickly to their credit. All the web links that I had on the prior slide are on this. I'll include it in the chat. And then the link on the bottom is actually uh, an uh, FAQ, or frequently asked questions that any of our staff put together, not just on personal financial information, also on things affecting your transactions. And lastly, even if you aren't taking advantage of forbearance or think you might need to take advantage of forbearance, this is great information to share with your clients, past, present, and in future, because this is just a great way to center yourself at the, at the, as the really important, valuable uh, resource in the transaction. So with that, I'm going to hand over uh, the baton to Vice Chair Donna Smith. Thank you so much, Ken. That was wonderful information, and we need all that information to share with all of our clients and customers. Hey, guys, you know, when we were in our what was then the norm, and then all of a sudden we came into this virtual world, I have to tell you, I was really concerned. I was more concerned about what's going to happen to our businesses, uh, just in general. How about our agents? And what about our local, state, and national association? And wow, look what happened. Realtor Engagement Committee got together and we said, our job is to make sure our members have all the information they need and they need to have it now, ASAP. So that's what these webinars are about. We're here to help you get the information as quickly as possible from all the experts that's available, just so you can stay on the top of your game and be ahead of everything. I want to thank each of our speakers today. We appreciate you and all your hard work and taking the time to bring that information to us. And I want to thank all those that participated in this in attendance because I want to thank you for being at the top of your game and your profession. I hope you'll join us for our next webinar and thanks to everybody. Have a great day.